So good afternoon, Lauren. Welcome to uh, season 10 of the Wisdom of Friends show. I'm super excited as we were uh, talking earlier here that you have an incredible story uh, about your Olympic journey. And I'm so glad that you made the time to be on the show and share your wisdom with my audience. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Lauren. So one of the ways we kick off our show is by asking a guest a simple yet profound question. And that is, What's your favorite quotation or philosophy that you live by and how have you applied it to your life? Yeah, I think one of my favorite sayings is it is never too late to be who you were meant to become. Mm. I think that fits in perfectly with your choices that you made in life. And we'll get to that here in a second. Uh, and for the benefit of the audience here, Lauren uh, Gibbs is a bobsled break woman who has been on the U.S. national team since uh, 2014 uh, and 2015 season. In her Olympic debut at the Olympic Winter Games in 2018, she earned the silver medal with pilot Delana Myers Taylor. And now she has also earned 2016 World Championship bronze and 14 other World Cup medals. Uh, she's now preparing for the 2022 Winter Games. Uh, so what an incredible story. So let me start off by asking, and this is out of my curiosity, Lauren. So where did you grow up and uh, how would you describe your childhood? In other words, uh, what did your parents do and how did that shape your life? Yeah, so I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. That's where I am now, actually. So not a ton of bobsledding in LA. I'm actually sitting out on my parents' deck. It's a beautiful, like, 78 degrees out. Um, so I think a winter sport is far from anything that could have potentially been in my imagination. My mother is an executive director at a senior center um, in Pasadena. Growing up, she worked in TV news. And then my dad is a clinical psychologist, and he specializes in custody evaluations. So... Um, I'm very fortunate to have the parents, the older brother that I have. Um, they sent me to some of the best schools. I went to an all girls high school. Um, and in that environment, I was always told that I could do and be anything that I dreamed of being as long as I was willing to work for it. Um, and I think my parents and family were always good at just fostering my natural competitiveness, um, my voice, right? I was, I was always the type of kid that if I was upset, I was going to tell you how I, how I felt and what I thought. And, you know, I think to a certain extent, they gave me the leeway to be, of course, respectful, but to, to speak my mind. Uh, my mom says, you know, she's always thought I was going to be an athlete. I climbed out of my crib at eight months old before I could walk. And, uh, yeah, I've just always been somebody that enjoyed charting their own path. No, that's so great. Sounds like, uh, you know, you've had an amazing childhood and like some uh, really role models in your parents who are highly qualified and, uh, you know, have their own credentials and their own respect. And uh, so that's certainly has been your inspiration. And, uh, and, and, you know, like looking at your, and, you know, we've talked before and like, you know, you've shared your story and this is such a, I mean, every time I hear about it, every time I think about it, it's such a inspirational story that, you can choose to live your life and really uh, achieve your full potential at any uh, point in your life, any point in your career. And that's really uh, what the message that, uh, you know, you talk about in your, you know, you've also given a TED talk as well and uh, people and we'll link that up in our show notes here. So Lauren, so my question to you is like, obviously, you know, you followed the corporate background and, you know, they're out and you really, uh, made it to the boardroom as your TED talk uh, implies and, you know, we're managing, uh, you know, 200 people and, uh, you know, and then out of like a whim and out of, a, you know, just you decide to go to this Olympic training center. And then, uh, so tell us that story, Lauren, how did that come about? What made you like go to that OTC and yeah, you know, people ask me all the time, how did you choose bobsled? And I always say, I didn't choose it. Bobsled chose me. Um, it really was, I, I tried it as a joke, you know, one of my good friends, her name's Jill Potter, it was August of 2014, and she was training for the 2016 Olympics, uh, because rugby had just been reintroduced into the Olympics, and so um, in her training, she ran into a bobsledder, who, uh, bobsledders are always recruiting new people, and she tried to recruit some of the rugby women, and the rugby women were like, no, but uh, Jill was kind of like, hey, I know, I know somebody, Right. So it was a, a random Wednesday in a, in a CrossFit gym in Denver, Colorado. I'd moved by then. And she's just like, I think you should bobsled. And 
to me, it was it was funny because Bobsled to me was a 1990s Disney movie, right? It was Cool Runnings. Um, cool Runnings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I really knew very little about the sport. Um, and also, like my perception of what an Olympian was was somebody who found a sport at four years old uh, was most likely homeschooled because they focused so much on their sport and their life's work in sport culminated in the Olympic Games. So to think that I could pick up an Olympic sport at 30 um, just didn't make sense to me. But uh, four years prior, I had, I had made a, a promise to myself to fully vet every opportunity that came to me because it was during a time in my life uh, during the 10, 2010 housing crisis that I was unemployed and 26 and had this fantasy of like what my perfect job would look like. And I learned very, very quickly that if you're only accepting perfection, uh, you're going to be waiting for a long time. And so um, that promise to myself got me the job that I was in at the time. And I really hate hypocrisy. So I thought at a bare minimum, if it's something that I can do fairly conveniently, then I'll check it out. And I got lucky that there was an Olympic training center an hour from me in Colorado Springs, that they were holding a tryout on a weekend and that it was really open to anybody. And so you know, I went down with the intention of trying out, of touring the facility, having a meal in the cafeteria, and that really being it. Uh, and I always say, I tried it as a joke, and the joke, I guess, is on me. So, so, so no, this is great. So, a couple of things that stand out from just your brief share here. One is that, you know, you definitely shifted your mindset, because at that point, you were really so committed to perfection, and, you know, nothing less, right? I mean, and then there is a Zen saying that, you know, perfection really is a sign of insecurity in a lot of ways because you're not really committing and you're waiting and you're waiting. And you're absolutely right. And that was like a really a mature way of self-reflection and saying you're going to vet those opportunities. And that made you choose that path of like, okay, let's even check it out yeah. and see what it is. And to give a little context here, uh, Lauren, I mean, you've been a you know, athlete growing up. Mm -hmm. You've kind of like been a volleyball champion. You've kind of like, you know, been working out uh, a CrossFit, uh, you know, enthusiast. And, you know, you've been a disciplined athlete uh, all your life. But this was something that just came out of the blue, right? I mean, it wasn't something that you were planning on. I mean, it was, uh, so, well, I don't know about that. So let me ask you this. Was there a moment like growing up for you? Like you had this inclination because it had to, inspire you in uh, Colorado Springs to even go check it out because was there like a moment in your childhood that you thought like this this is something I really would like to do at some point or yeah I think any kid that grows up being an athlete you know either dreams of going pro and or dreams of going to the Olympics but you know my first love of sport was soccer and like at 16 I realized I wasn't great at soccer so my second uh you know, a real focus in sport was um, volleyball. I ended up playing volleyball at Brown University. You know, I was academic all Ivy, second team all Ivy. I was a co-captain, did well, but I'm five foot ten, so I was. I, I knew I was never going to be um, a professional volleyball player, and so I figured, you know, yeah, the Olympics that sounds cool, but I really had come to the conclusion that the opportunity and the time in my life to make that happen had passed long before, so. Um, I couldn't have predict predicted this life, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's really, uh, and then we'll continue with the story here. So another question that comes up for me is, you know, when you think about bobsled, and a lot of, I, I, I mean, I would be surprised if every American knew what this sport is, because most of them have this idea that it's just a movie, right? It's like mm -hmm. the cool runnings with John Candy, and, you know, it's, it's like, so did you, like, know, like, detail of what this sport entailed, or... What was the, I mean, like, what was the surprise for you in that regard? Yeah, I mean, uh, like, uh, like I said, the only thing I really knew about bobsled was cool runnings. Um, I, I don't know if I even realized it was an Olympic sport at that time, which I think is funny. The first bobsled race that I ever watched, I technically competed in. Um, so I, I knew basically nothing about the sport. Yeah. So. Okay. And then uh, walk us through that, Lauren, if you don't mind. Like, you know, you walk into the Olympic Training Center for the tryout. What was that experience like the first time around? Like, you know, it's like people who are listening to this, they may be aspiring to 
go give a tryout, but they're like afraid to like compete with all these other Olympians. And you know, what was your mindset like? How did you go and uh, have a good time? What was it like for you? Yeah, it was it was crazy. I think part of the reason that I really enjoyed my time there is I really had no expectation of succeeding at it. You know, I I had no expectation that it was going to go further. But I think, you know, the the cool thing is that bobsled is definitely one of those sports that most people start later in life, right? Maybe not quite as late as I have, but later in life. Um, And it's one of those sports where a lot of different sports transfer well into bobsled. Um, I think the obvious speeder sport is track and field, but, you know, volleyball is a power sport and a lot of power is necessary to do it. And I think most of the people there kind of had for the, for the most part, the same kind of feeling like they just kind of wanted to feel it out and see if there was like potential for them. And there was a wide range of people. I remember talking to this one woman and she was talking about school and I was like, geez, I'm competing against a a college athlete. And I was like, what school do you go to? And she told me and it, I said, I've never heard of that college. And she was like, that's because it's a high school. She was 17. So, um, right then and there, I felt like I should probably go home because I was, I figured I was going to embarrass myself. Obviously gra- glad that I didn't, but um, yeah, it was really cool. It was like, I felt like, you know, I love the Olympics, but had no, no sense that there were Olympic training centers. Mm-hmm. And so just the opportunity to kind of get a little behind the scenes look um, at the Olympic games was really my only intention. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So yeah. did you know, like, right after that trial, like, you were selected and you were ready to go for uh, the next step? or how did No. That in fact, I was like, that was fun. Like, I can't wait to tell my coworkers on Monday, like, this crazy thing I just did for the weekend. Like, it was like my weekend adventure. And so about a week later, I got an email saying, congratulations, you've been invited to rookie camp. And I thought for sure uh, they got the wrong person, their, their information mixed up. But, like, again, they were offering a week-long – camp at another Olympic training center, um, this time in upstate New York. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there is one in Colorado Springs and there's one in Lake Placid, New York, which is about two, two hours south of Montreal and five hours north of, of the city. And I thought, man, you're going to let me stay in an Olympic training center for free. All I got to do is fly myself there um, for a week. And I was like, that sounds cool. Like how many people get that opportunity um, to experience the Olympics in that way? Um, I went out there. I met my now best friend. She was like the first person I met and got to hold her Olympic medal. She'd already won one in Sochi. Got to, you know, meet some of the best bobsledders in the country um, and just got a little introduction to the sport. And even at that point, um, I had no, I guess, expectation that I was actually going to bobsled. Um, And I was really just kind of, (laughs) no pun intended, along for the ride. You know, I just wanted to I wanted to see how far this would go. And I, I figured at some point they'd realize this 30 year old was not going to be a good fit for their team, but here I am 36 still competing. So that's, that's, that's amazing. So inspiring. So one of the questions, Lauren, we get from our audience is, you know, how do we find our passion? How do we find our calling? You know, they might be stuck in another job and, you know, they're getting, they're good at it, but that's really not where their heart is but they're afraid to make that leap, right? They're afraid to like switch careers. And what would be your advice to somebody like that who's struggling in that situation? And, you know? Yeah. You know, I always find value in, I always try and find value in every situation. I have. I've had jobs that I've loved and I've had jobs that just didn't seem like a good fit. But I think the first thing that's been really helpful is even when things aren't going well is to find some sort of value. Um, and I think too often, as humans, we're just not willing to ask for what we need or make or or think that like something our experience could be different, right? So if you, I, I would say if like you're in a job that you don't like, maybe talk to your manager about ways that you could like it more and maybe be more effective and and you know provide for the company and your customers better. I always think that um, in the right organizations, there should always be room for conversations about how to improve your experience and your customer's experience because I think someone that is happy at work does does great work so that that's what I'd say that the first thing is and then man I think finding your passion can be so overwhelming like you're 
you're actively seeking your passion. And for me, um, I, being at my parents' house during quarantine, we've been looking through a lot of the, my old like school papers and things. And like, it was all like, oh, I'm going to go to Stanford. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to do this and be married by this time. And basically none of the things that I thought I was going to do as a kid, I, I've done. Uh, and I, I can't say um, what I, I regret it because what I have done, I've really enjoyed. But I think the, the biggest piece for me in finding my passion is just being open to opportunity, right? It's like, you don't have to say yes and do everything, but I think that people should be open to thinking about things in a different way, open to different opportunities, and at a bare minimum, look into the things that come across their inbox or uh, their desk or what have you. Yeah, and I think uh, the point that you uh, highlight uh, so beautifully was that being open to opportunities and you know, being curious to see what this next, you know, opportunity might look like. And, yeah. uh, no, that's so great. And then having the conversation, absolutely. And because, you know, there's always room for negotiation. You can always have a conversation with your uh, boss and with mm -hmm. the organization you're part of to see how you could add value differently right. if, uh, you know, that's a win-win. Uh, no, that's so great. So now it's been like uh, 2014 and it's 2020. It's almost six years since that, you know, that day when, you know, you earned your, uh, you know, medal. Mm -hmm. So now you can do this in your sleep. You're like, uh, you're the top, the best athlete, the best, best, you know, bobsled break woman in the world. Like, you know, there's like no doubt in my mind. So like, but was there a moment like in your in this journey of the Olympic journey that, you know, that is like, you know, we all have these strategic inflection points, right? It's like that moment when everything flips, it's like, this is, I could totally do this. This is like, this is like a complete marriage between me and my sport here. I can, I can handle it. This is cool. Was there a moment for you, like when, you know, everything, like you started getting into that zone and, you know, that's like, it became second nature to you? I think that, um... I'm sure that is, it's that way for some people, but I think for me, uh, because even when I started bobsledding, the idea of actually making it to the Olympics seems so just far and away that I was taking it like one experience at a time, one season at a time. And when I started, I was so just not great. I was, wasn't great at the sport. Like I had a lot of work to do. Um, so I just, I, for me, it was more of an opportunity to move away from a career that I really didn't love, but like didn't know how to leave um, and take the time to kind of figure out what I meant to do. So I would say for me, there wasn't like one moment where I was like, oh, this actually, that, that's not true. The, the one moment that I knew I'd gotten it is when they told me I was going to be on the Olympic team. But other than that, um, I think, you know, that, that, uh, that graphic about like success is in a straight line. It's, you know, that squiggly line that goes yeah, all over the place. Curved, and that, yeah. That's really true. There'd be like some weeks where I'd be like, man, I'm crushing this. Like I feel so fit. I feel so fast. Everything's clicking. And then like the very next week I'd be tripping over myself, falling on my face and feel like I just started. And I'll tell you what, even after winning a medal in this past season, I, my teammate and I actually won world championship. So I guess for the year of 2020, I am the best brakeman in the world. Um, I'll have to hopefully defend my title next, next season in 2021. But, um, you know, every, there's a part of every season where I think, man, I just overstayed my welcome and it's time to hang it up. And then, you know, I make the decision that um, today's not the day to quit and I'm just going to pour everything I have into it. And it, and it seems to work its, its, itself out. It doesn't mean that I, the season always ends the way I expect it to, but I always either grow from it, learn from it, or improve from it. No, that's, that's awesome. Uh, that sparks another question for me. Uh, you know, was there like a, one of your favorite setbacks? And what I mean by that is, you know, like in hindsight, when you look at it, it's like it's become your glory moment, right? It's like something this happened and that's why I'm here, you know? So, and really like what I'm trying to get to is like, how did you uh, self-reflect on that situation and how did you, because that's one thing I know, I notice, uh, Lauren, you do so brilliantly in self-reflection. I mean, you know, you're able to analyze certain things and come up with these lessons, these gems of wisdom that's instantly practical and applicable. So tell us about, like, if you can recall a moment like that in your life or career that uh, was a setback. 
Yeah, absolutely. So after winning a world championship medal in 2016, uh, I got injured that summer. And so came into the season injured. And it just wasn't like the 2016, 2017 season just wasn't looking great. Um, I ended up racing, which was great and was ended the, that past season as USA one and was basically a, a solid USA three um, breakman at that time. And like, I think we always want to be in the, in the top sled, but in hindsight, it was such a good opportunity for me. Um, first and foremost, you know, when I started this sport, um, it was right off the 2014 game. So I was basically racing with three pilots that just came off of some of their best performances. And I was a rookie feeling like I was just screwing up every which way, right? And that kind of continued into my second season. I, I, I'm a bit of a slow learner in some instances, especially when it comes to like controlling my limbs. Like I'm not, I'm not uh, naturally uh, coordinated. Fun, fun fact there. And the pilot that I was lucky enough to race with, her name's Brittany Reinbold. It was her first time as a pilot on the World Cup. And so she was excited to be there. She was excited to have me in her sled. And it was just nice to feel like, not that there wasn't any pressure, but it was like, I was enough for this person, right? She was proud and honored to race with me, which I'm not saying the other pilots weren't. It was just they were like the best, the best, the best, and had been for so long that like I felt like every little step I took was analyzed, and it was for, for good reason. And so just a year of sliding with somebody, and I felt like we were learning together along the way, and it was more of a collaborative um, relationship, and I felt like I was actually adding value to our performances. And then, you know, we ended that season, and we didn't do great at world championships, but we pushed really close to the speeds that the top sleds had done and essentially my job is just to push fast and so it was like man this isn't the season results wise that I would have wanted going into the games but I couldn't have asked for a better performance season from myself um, and I think that that year of basically feeling like I really needed to to make some changes and some moves and to show people that I was the right person in that year gave me a lot of confidence going into the summer that like, man, if I come in healthy this year, it's, it's going to be my show. Um, and that, that's kind of what happened. It wasn't, it still wasn't easy because man, talk about competing against some of the most talented females pe people I've ever met in my life. People always ask if I was nervous at the games. I was like, no, the games was like the reward. I was nervous that four years leading up to it. It's just, it was like, I would say it's like competing in the Hunger Games. Like it's just if you if you misstep or just screw up a little bit, there is somebody just chomping at the bit to take your spot because mm -hmm. everybody at that level is so proficient, so hardworking. It's not enough just to be to really want it. It's not enough to be competitive. It's not enough to be one of the best. You have to be the best. And so I think that one year of you know taking a little bit step back and uh, really being allowed to make mistakes and be human and work on my craft really, really set me up well for the Olympic season and making the team. Well, that's so great. And thank you for sharing, Lauren. Uh, that's really inspiring. So, uh, you know, who were your mentors growing up? Like, uh, did you have like any specific people that you looked up to that, em that you wanted to emulate and that you think played a big factor in the successes you've had? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my parents obviously are two of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. And they've, they've always worked so hard and been very honest about the fact that they work hard to try and give me things that they didn't have. And so I thought that's pretty cool to have two people that are just always in your corner. And then as far as athletes are concerned, you know, I was a soccer player when I was young. So um, Brianna Scurry, uh, Mia Hamm, Brandi Chastain, um, Michelle Akers, you know, the 99 World Cup championship team were some of my uh, men, like, well, just idols, I guess. Um, and then in figure skating was one of my first loves because my neighbor was a figure skater. So I grew up watching Michelle Kwan and Chris Yamaguchi. Um, and yeah, so it was just, I had uh, mentors in my parents and then idols in, in these athletes that I was like, wow, look at these women just doing amazing things. So I, I was pretty fortunate to have a good, um, just, just a ton of role models to look up to, you know? Right. So, so what are some of the things like you, uh, what are your hobbies now? Like when you're not uh, practicing and not working out and how do you, what are some uh, interests and hobbies that you have? 
Yeah, you know, I, I left corporate America, but, you know, I still have my executive MBA from Pepperdine. I have a business degree from Brown. And so I really enjoy um, business, sales, marketing, management, that kind of stuff, leadership, organizational behavior. And so I do a lot of consulting with different brands and different companies. And then I also do uh, a lot of public speaking. And now with COVID, all of that public speaking is virtual. I think, um, obviously, we met on an Airbnb experience, but I've also done a lot with just you know, Zoom calls for team meetings. I think no one expected this to go as, as long as it is. And so I think there are organizations that are running out of things to talk about and motivation. So like, why not bring in an Olympian with a business background to relate uh, elite athletics to uh, business and leadership and sales and marketing, all that good stuff. And so I really enjoy um, seeing the nuggets that people pull out of their story, out of my story to relate to themselves because I think too often in this social media culture that we, we live in, um, people just see uh, other people's highlight reels and they assume that um, the successes they have aren't successes they, they themselves could achieve because there's this like need to separate ourselves from the people that we look up to. And so my goal really is to relay the fact that there's a lot of things about me that are pretty normal and that aren't extraordinary. I think I have extraordinary ability to, to build muscle. Um, but the rest of it was all grit, hard work, determination, and just, just a decision that I made that I was win, lose, or draw. I was going to give my all. And so I think once you figure out how to achieve success in one area, it's so much easier to, du to duplicate it in different areas of, of your life. And I genuinely believe that if more people do more of the things that they really enjoy on top of the things that they have to do, you know, to be a responsible human being and a contributing member of society, that a lot of the issues that we have in our, our society, in our country, in our world, wouldn't be an issue. Um, because if people, basic needs are met, right? If we, we're talking business, like if we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If people's basic needs are met, or like if security, uh, satisfaction, contentness, you know, love, all that good stuff is met, uh, if we're talking about soft skills, then there's very little room for hate and unnecessary violence. No, that's uh, definitely, uh, you bring up a very, very good point. And, uh, you know, it's absolutely, you know, your first uh, basic needs are met, then you kind of focus on self-actualization using right. the Maslow's uh, hierarchy, absolutely. Uh, and then we'll include uh, your uh, links and everything in our show notes so you know, people can uh, find out more about you, about your speaking, consulting, and uh, as well as, and uh, I, I would also highly, highly recommend uh, listening to Lauren's TED Talk, uh, which is so inspirational, and you can find it on YouTube or on the TED uh, channel as well. Uh, so any recommendations of good books that you read lately uh, for audience on leadership or business? Yeah, I'd say um, I really like, this isn't necessarily specifically to business and leadership, but I really like the book, for, The Four Agreements. Um, and the concept behind the four agreements is, is talking about just understanding interactions with people, right? When people are, are, are rude to you or they're kind to you, it says more about them than you. Um, it's a quick read. Um, I'm currently reading uh, Building a Story Brand, uh, which I think is really interesting, obviously, as an Olympic athlete and a public speaker who's kind of trying to create a side hustle into her main hustle, right? I'm, I'm trying to figure out who I am and what my brand is. Um, and making sure that that marries up with like what I'm genuinely about, but also uh, putting it out in a way that people understand it and see value in working with me. Um, so I really like building a story brand. Um, and I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think those are those are my two two favorites right now. You know, I've yeah, read a lot of those, sales books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sales is just a way of life. It doesn't matter what profession you're in. It's like yeah. you're always uh, in the conversation about uh, marketing and selling. But no, those yeah, two books like are really, really a great uh, recommendation. The Four Agreements, yeah. Don Miguel, who is, I mean, that's a classic. And uh, yeah, that's... Yeah. And uh, then one of my good friends, he, we, we grew up in sales together. We both sold, sold, sold Cutco. Uh, back in the day, for those of you who remember Cutco knives, they're still around, by the way, the great oh, knives, yeah, yeah, American yeah. made. Um, yeah. He just put out a book called Catapulting Commission. So he's been in the sales game a long time. I got to write the forward for that book, which is really cool. So Catapulting Commissions by Anthony Garcia, I think is great um, for anybody that's in sales and potentially looking to take their 
commission check to the next level. Um, I really like that. And so um, I'm currently reading that book. And uh, yes, and I will include all of those in the show notes as well. So we can find out more about it. So here's a hypothetical uh, question for you, uh, Lauren. Let's say you, you know, we uh, go back in time and, mm -hmm. and you have this opportunity to talk to your young self, you know, in, in early, uh, you know, in the early 20s or what advice would you give her? Mm. Especially, it's funny that you pick my 20s because I feel like so many people talk about how great their 20s are and mine were pretty miserable. Um, you know, at 26 years old, <laughs> I felt like I had screwed everything up. Imagine being unemployed in the middle of a, a housing crisis where the unemployment rate is skyrocketing and, you know, you've just graduated from this really expensive university and, and no one wants to pay you to do anything. And so um, I had gotten to this place where I felt like maybe I'd screwed up so much, it'd be better if I didn't exist anymore. And I don't think that I ever really would have intended to, to do anything to myself, but like to have that kind of pain and suffering and just that like let down, like I, like I really felt like I'd let my family down. I'd let down all the people who told me I was, uh, you know, um, destined for greatness. Uh, I would tell my younger self that only you can uh, determine what success means for yourself because at that time um, to me success was a job title you know a sal a, a specific number in salary specific kind of car specific kind of home or apartment um, clothes bags you know superficial stuff and there's nothing wrong with making money don't get me wrong um, I plan to make the kind of money I was making uh, before and I'm already on my way now in 2020, which is crazy, right? Um, but it really shows you if if you're willing to be creative, that even in the middle of a pandemic, you can find a way. You can find your way. And uh, so yeah, to my younger self, I would just say it's it's gonna be all right, kid. Just just keep going. Like it's you know just because you haven't figured it all out yet by your 20s doesn't mean you won't figure it out eventually. And I think that's so important, right? I've met so many different types of people in my uh, travels in sport and my travels in speaking. And, you know, I met this uh, 70 year old man who had retired five years prior and he had this tear in his eye after listening to my talk. And he was like, I've never connected to a speaker more. And I said, why? He goes, because, you know, at 65, I retired and I didn't know what was next for me. And I happened to try woodworking and now I'm a champion woodworker. And he's like, that's what I was meant to be. That is, that is my life's passion, my life's work. And I found it at 65. And so, that's what I would say is that everybody's time to find what they're meant to be happens at a different time. That's uh, uh, so great. Um, yeah, no, that's really inspiring. So are we going to switch gears here uh, and talk to you a little bit about the mindsets and habits uh, of a champion athlete uh, like yourself, Lauren. So one question that comes up is, you know, what's, what, what's your daily morning and evening rituals look like when you're performing at your peak, especially, you know, you are getting ready for the Olympics, let's say, you know, you're six months out for the Olympics or three months out, you're already in that zone, right? What's, what, what are some of your rituals? What do you do? Yeah, it's a, it's a very calculated time, right? Because essentially, especially that close, but even, even now, because, um, my sport is very specific in the sense that like, I can't just go bobsled any time, right? So I have to really make the months that I am bobsledding count. Um, and so there is an understanding that of everything that I do in, in my day, in my week, in my month, in my year, in the four year cycle is potentially either going to push me closer to my goal or pull me further away. So if I'm going to spend time on something in either better add towards pushing me to closer to my goal or really be worth it right so i get really regimented with my sleep i get really regimented with my training i get really regimented with my nutrition my hydration how i spend my time who i spend my time with my recovery uh my rehab stuff like thinking in advance my travel you know if i'm going to travel somewhere you know I'm going to, I'm going to buy a better seat on an airplane so that I can get there and my body doesn't feel like complete garbage, you know? And so there's just a lot of thought that goes into planning and preparing for the Olympics where you really start to understand what it means to have a singular focus and for that singular focus to be more important than anything else 
uh, that, that, that comes into your life. And so it's, it's hard, right? Because I missed a lot of weddings. I, I missed a lot of baby showers. I missed, I have the cutest niece and nephew and I missed a lot of their birthdays and recitals and mother's day, sometimes father's day. Um, but you know what? We all got to go to Korea and celebrate. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So another question that comes up for me is like, you know, you know, let's say, let's kind of like put a line of demarcation from the time you walked into the Olympic Center in Colorado Springs. Uh, and then, you know, the journey began for you, right? So what would you say was like one best piece of advice that you kind of like learned since then that's been a game changer for you, uh, for your life, your career? Yeah, so uh, I can't remember what year I was in. I think it was either like year one, two, somewhere in like early years of my boss' career. I was talking to the pilot who inadvertently um, recruited me and also ended up being the pilot that I won the world championship medal in 2016 and the pilot that I won the silver medal with, silver medal with in 2018. She said, you can't just want to go to the Olympics you have to prepare like you're going to win the gold medal because everybody wants to go to the Olympics, but there is a significant difference between going and being the best. And that just, it stuck with me. And so like every time I didn't want to do a workout or every time I was like kind of dragging uh, through a workout, you know, that last rep I'd say to myself, this is run for at the Olympics. Like if you're tired, the last run of the Olympics, are you going to still give it your all? Or are you just going to kind of show up? Um, and so that was, that was, I, I think, I don't even think she remembers saying that to me. Uh, but that really made me think it was like everybody in my, on my team, right. In my circle at that time, all wanted the same thing. We all wanted to go to the Olympics and, and win a medal, but it could only be, it could only be one person that went and won the goal. Right. And so I had to go above and beyond to make sure that I could differentiate myself against those other talented athletes to achieve my dream. And so it wasn't enough to just want to go. I had to want to go and expect to be the best. No, that's great. And, and there's another question. And that's that's so awesome. Right? I mean, the distinction that you draw about, you know, it's about going to the Olympics as a participant, but, uh, you know, winning the goal. That's the whole other mindset completely. Uh, and I was talking to Bria Larson. I don't know if you know her, but she's like the Olympic yeah. gold medalist. Uh, and Swimmer, uh, yeah, yeah. and she, yeah, she was on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago here. And and she talked about like having a race strategy, like, you know, that's her race strategy that when she competes in. Uh, so the question for you uh, is, uh, do you have a race strategy and are you willing to improvise if needed in that moment? Or do you stick to the race strategy given the circumstances? I mean, I think there are some things that you're always going to do, right? That you're not going to just show up on race day and just like have a completely different technique. So I think you want to practice how you intend to race. But I think sometimes what race strategies can be come for some people are superstitions, right? So if you don't have the right socks or you're like, you know, obviously – I don't have a ton of bobsled spikes, but I have two pairs. And so I, let's say I forget my race bikes and accidentally I have my practice bikes. Or, you know, if I rip my suit and I have to buy another one. Or, you know, if I change my sports bra, I'm not going to be able to compete. And so I've tried really hard not to have a ton of rituals because I don't want my success in any one performance, especially not the biggest performance of my life, to be determined by whether or not I forgot to put my socks in my bag. And so, yeah, do I have a race ritual? Absolutely. But I am also very cognizant of that if, if everything goes wrong, I'm still going to execute. If I don't get to listen to the right music or I don't show up with water or I have to borrow my teammates' speed suit because I forgot mine or if I have to borrow spikes or something happens to my helmet at the last moment and I need to switch it out for another one, none of that stuff is going to get in the way of me competing. Unless I can't find another helmet, then it's a problem because they won't let you down without a helmet. Um, but I've worked really hard um, and overcome some stuff during practices and races and been like, okay, well, now if this happens at the Olympic Games, it's not going to be an issue because I've already seen it. I've already dealt with it. I've already overcome it. And so I think more than so much of a race ritual for me personally um, is a mentality of creating solutions to problems that could potentially get in the way 
of what you're trying to accomplish. Oh, uh, that's, that's awesome. That's definitely a different perspective I've heard, but, uh, but I totally get it. It's like, you know, nothing should get in the way, no matter what happens. So having, right. not having, uh, having the rituals, but not even the rituals getting in the way of winning. Right. So like that. Uh, and here's another, uh, do you recall that moment, Lauren, I, you know, when you won that Olympic medal for the first time? What was that like for you? Like, you know, you stepped on that podium and winning it. So describe that moment for us, please. Yeah, it's actually funny because, so the way Bob said works is we do four runs over two days. And after the first run, they basically run you in reverse order. After the, after the second day, they run you in reverse order. So the fastest people go at the end. So we were in second place going into the last run. We had out pushed the first place team by like six tenths of a second. And so we were, but they had caught us and we were only, uh, I think four hundredths of a second back. So we pushed um, another great push. We were going to be another two tenths ahead of them at the push. And it was a good run. And honestly, I came down in that last run thinking I was an Olympic champion and a gold medalist. And so what they do is when like just after you've raced, if you beat the person that went down before you, you stand in the leader's box and you watch who's in front of you come down. And so I'm watching them coming down. I'm crouching and it's not just me. It's like the la they had like the last three sleds up instead of two or instead of one because it's the Olympics and it's more exciting that way. And so we had the Canadian team, we had the German team and it was us and we're just like all watching and it's another German team coming down and they pushed and that put us like basically 1800s ahead. And we just saw as the time just started to like get smaller and smaller and smaller until it was like a tie. And I was like, okay, I'll take a tie. And then the next thing you know, they started to get ahead. And so there's definitely that moment of like, I come down from the, the last run and no matter what, I'm, I know I'm an Olymp Olympic medalist and that's crazy, right? Because I just won an Olympic medal in a sport that I tried out for as a joke three and a half years prior. And then to add to that, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I just became a gold medalist. And then to then, to then I'm like, oh, actually you're a silver medalist. And it's not that uh, I'm mad about the silver medal or even mad about losing out the gold. Like it's, like I said, three and a half years to an Olympic medal. There are some people that work their entire lives as an athlete and never make it to the games, but it was definitely like a roller coaster of emotions. And, um, and then you go, like, you don't get your medal that night because we ended at like 10 p.m. And then I got drug tested. We had, a, we had a press conference. So they drew blood. They had me pee in a cup, all that good stuff. So the nice thing is I know that my medal is my medal. They've tested my urine. We're clean. Uh, not that it was a question. And then you wake up the next day and you have a full day of media. So like I was up at 6 a.m. having gone to bed at like 11 p.m. Trying to sleep after you've won an Olympic medal is insane. And then it's like a full day of media. You're meeting with NBC, you're meeting with BuzzFeed, you're meeting with all these different news outlets. Um, and then like at 7 p.m. at night, they bring you to the metal plaza. And the cool thing is, is there's a number of different uh, sports that are, are receiving their medals that night. So like, I think the same night we won, Cross Country won uh, the sprint medal and Lindsey Vaughn won a medal. I think Mich Michaela Schiffer might've won. So you get your medal and you go do more press. I was on the Today Show and it was just, um, overwhelming in like the best way possible and I remember uh, Anita de France gave me my medal she's an amazing Olympic medalist rower and just like such an amazing role model and she put the medal around my head and my first words were like this is heavy <laughs> right <laughs> and I guess it I think they caught it on tv because I was like I heard you say that and I was like well it really it, those are the heaviest medals they've ever made I, mean, I think mine's like two pounds of silver and it's 99.9% .9 silver and so it was just like, imagine a moment where everything you work for just kind of pans out and your dreams come true. I, wow. I don't, yeah, it's like, a, it, it, I have no words really for it. You know, it was like this moment of validation that I didn't know I needed. It was this like, hey kid, you remember that kid that was on the couch 10 years ago wishing she never exists, she didn't exist anymore? and like thinking she had completely screwed up her life. Well, look what she's doing now, you know? And so it's just, yeah. That's such a beautiful, uh, you know, it's beautiful, beautiful share there. Yeah. Um, 
switching gears, I mean, this is like in an interest of time, we're going to get into the next uh, section here, rapid fire round, Lauren. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of random questions and it's your first response that comes to your mind. Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So the first question for you is, uh, what, who's your favorite music band? Oh, my favorite music. Um, Beyonce. Okay, right. And then uh, whose brain would you like to pick? Uh, brain who I'd like to pick. Um, Obama. A oh, great choice. Yeah. Uh, what color describes you best? Safoam. Mm. And it's, it's really sea foam, but I say it's a foam because it's like no one really knows what color it really is. Is it green? <laughs> is it blue? We're not sure, right? And I like to keep, keep it's a mystery guessing. color. <laughs> exactly. I'm a mystery and I tend to say that way. <laughs> All right. If you could be successful in another profession, which would you choose? Um, I think it'd be fun to be an actress. Mm. Yeah, I've or like a singer. I've always really loved singing, but I have terrible stage fright, and I've always really enjoyed acting. And so I think for me, public speaking is like my version of acting. It's my version of theater. Like I enjoy the energy in the room and like seeing where jokes land and like changing the um, just the mood in the room. Like going from like high highs and excitement and like bringing them into quiet dramatic time in my life. So I, I really enjoy that part of public speaking. That's great. And then uh, the five most important things in life, according to you. Health, family, and that's uh, related to you and chosen family, uh, kindness, uh, self-reflection, and stability. Mm, I like that. What's your favorite phrase that you like to say to yourself? Work harder, work harder, work harder. Stop complaining about having to work harder. Cool. And then uh, one final question within the rapid fire on. Let's say, Lauren, you could have any message of your choice on a billboard, let's say New York City, Times Square. What would that be? What would be the message? You get one life, so make it a good one. Uh, that's awesome. All right, so that ends a rapid fire run, and I got one, three final questions for you, Lauren. And the first one is, what, what's your current personal or business passion project that you're working on, and uh, what are you looking forward to in the next six months or a year from now? Yeah, you know, it's crazy. Um, it's been bobsled for so long that it, it took a global pandemic for me to um, really, really switch gears and focus on other things. Um, I've always really enjoyed uh, facilitating important conversations. And by important, I mean, they are transformative for the group that I'm working with, right? It's like the ability to help people see that they have abilities beyond what they, in the in traditional sense or what they could have ever thought for themselves. And so I'm doing a lot of public speaking. Obviously it's not in person, a lot of virtual stuff, um, speaking for companies and organizations, um, being, getting on team calls. I'm also doing a lot of consulting. Um, there's a platform that I'm working with, an online platform called Parity. And what Parity is designed to do is to close the, the pay gap for professional female athletes. Uh, not so fun fact for you, there's about $66 billion uh, in global sponsorship dollars spent annually. And about 0.4% of that goes to female athletes. Mm. You look at the Forbes top 100 list of professional uh, athletes, their, their, uh, their income, uh, only two of those people are women and it's Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka and they're like halfway down the list. And so, um, the cool thing about parody is it's not just about closing the pay gap, but it's also about creating a community of women that, you know, work with each other to, to solve the issue ourselves, right. Instead of having someone figure it out for us, but also there are a lot of opportunities for both, um, professional and personal growth because what people don't understand about athletes is that it is really a full-time job. It's really hard to, to do work and get experience outside of your 
immediate sport. And so I feel like a lot of athletes retire and feel like I don't know what's next and kind of just jump into whatever will pay them because they have to still pay their bills. And so we, we are hoping to solve for that and help female athletes realize their worth outside of their performance, outside of their field, uh, outside of their sport and off of the playing field. Yeah, no, that's like uh, really, ones. yeah, no, that's, that's really amazing what you're doing, Lauren. Uh, how would you like uh, people to find out more about this and how can they reach you? Yeah, so um, you can reach out to me on my LinkedIn page. I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. Uh, if you're a social media fan, my uh, Instagram is always entertaining. So it's LA Gibbs 84. So I'd say either LinkedIn or my Instagram is probably the best way to reach me. You can slide into my DMs. I check them often. So I will respond to you. Okay, great. And I'll include that in the show notes as well. Uh, three things you're grateful for in life, Lauren. It's funny that you asked that because I do um, every Thursday, I do a, a thankful Thursday post. So today is Thursday. So I did that. Um, but three things that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for opportunity. Um, I am thankful for challenges because they make me better. And I am thankful to understand the importance of gratitude. Mm, nice. So Lauren, I want to take a couple of moments here to acknowledge you. Uh, you know, just listening to you share your life story and just being in your presence here virtually uh, and, and what you're up to in life and what you've accomplished is, is really that rare air uh, Olympian that has got a beautiful blend of like education at the highest levels, uh, you know, being an Olympian, which uh, is really about dedication, excellence, hard work, and then committing yourself at the highest level. And it's such a beautiful synchronicity and, uh, you know, dance between those two different, uh, you know, left and the right hemispheres. And you project that so beautifully in the world with everything that, that you're doing. And then the contribution that you're making for the female athletes and the work pay gap. And uh, that's really, really so inspiring. Uh, so thank you for everything that you're doing and who you're being. Yeah, thanks so much. It's just, uh, I, I truly believe we have one life. And so at the end of it, I just want to have done a lot of cool stuff and hopefully paid it forward um, to give others opportunity. So. Great. And uh, Lauren, this is uh, one final question. And this is how we uh, normally wrap up all our interviews. And that is, uh, why do you think people should listen to the wisdom of friends? Uh, because I think if we are constantly looking to learn from others, uh, we will all grow and have uh, a more fruitful life. That's awesome. Thank you, Lauren, again. I really enjoyed our conversation. This has been like, like really a special uh, evening uh, with everything that you've shared and thank you for your generosity. And for everybody listening, with that, we'll wrap it up. And if you like what you heard, please share. Don't be shy.